What are we discussing on today's Locked on Dimebacks podcast? The D-backs wrap up their West Coast road trip with a nice series victory over the San Diego Padres and updating the D-backs panic meter. You are Locked on Diamondbacks, your daily Arizona Diamondbacks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into the Locked On Dimebacks Podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Listening to who? Always charismatic host of this podcast, Miller Thomas. I'm a multimedia journalist and I'm a graphic designer, so please go check out my website, millerthomas24.myportfolio.com. On there, you see all my latest work, from my packages to my articles to my photos and my graphic design. Today's episode is brought to you by Tax Network USA. Did you know that it's never too late to resolve your tax issues with the IRS? Don't wait, reduce your tax debt, and get help from a team of licensed tax professionals. Call 1-800-549-1000 or visit tnusa.com slash lockdown. On today's Lockdown Dimebacks podcast, we'll talk about the D-backs crazy series against the San Diego Padres will update the panic meter and discuss why the D-backs need to be buyers at this year's MLB trade deadline. Thank you for making Locked on Dimebacks your first listen every day. I would not be able to do this podcast without you, my loyal listeners, sharing, subscribing, reviewing, doing all that so I could do this podcast for you. Thank you. It's free. It's available on all platforms. So please continue to tell your friends. And one of those platforms is YouTube. Please hit subscribe to Locked on Diamondbacks on YouTube. Our goal is to hit. What is our goal? Our goal right now is to hit uh, 1,200 subscribers. We're at 1133. So please hit subscribe to Locked on Diamondbacks on YouTube. All right, let's get into the podcast and let's talk about that D back series over the San Diego Padres because the D backs continue to take care of business. They started the month off with a nice series victory over the LA Dodgers, where that one could have been a sweep. Game number one, blown by Paul Seawald in a save opportunity. D backs come back in game two and game three, respond in a big way. Same against the Padres. D backs have an insane Friday night where they make an insane comeback, six runs in the ninth, but Paul Seawald unfortunately couldn't close it out. I won't say this series over the Padres should have been a sweep, even though it should have been, uh, but I won't say that only because that six run ninth inning, that is kind of anomaly. You don't see that very often. So not upset that the D-backs lost Friday night because they were able to respond in a big way holding off the Padres in game number two in extra innings, and then a convincing win in this series finale over the Padres. And now the D-backs own the Padres. uh, They own the tiebreaker over the Padres for their season record being better now than the Padres in their head-to-head matchup. So great job by the D-backs to own another tiebreaker in the wildcard race. I believe they currently own it over the Giants, and now they own it over the Padres. They own it over the Cincinnati Reds. So they're sacking their case. I think they might own it over the St. Louis Cardinals as well. I'll have to double-check that. But D-backs doing a great job. Back to 500 now as well, which is something that the D-backs have always been scratching and clawing to get back into. We know it's been a struggle to get back to 500. Now we need to see the D-backs climb above 500 and continue to look very good in the month of July. And I'm looking at the standings right now. They do own the tiebreaker over the Reds. They own it over the Giants. They now own it over the San Diego Padres as well. They're split with the New York Mets, so they don't own it there. Any other teams, they own it over the Nationals, which we care about, and they're tied with the St. Louis Cardinals. So in terms of teams in the wildcard race, the D-backs are looking very, very well right now. And some things that I really liked in this Padres series that the D-backs were able to do, one, we saw some of their struggling players from the season step up. We got to see early offense, which the D-backs have been able to do a great job of all year. We saw some 
late clutch offense by the D-backs, is, which is something we haven't seen enough of throughout the season. Then we saw some clutch pitching performances from Ryan Nelson and Humberto Casianos. Eugenio Suarez, he had himself a day in the finale, and honestly, he's been on a little bender recently. He had the double, which was huge late in the game in the finale. In the ninth inning to really break it open. Three runs, clearing the bases. He also had the uh, home run in the seventh inning late in the game. So, Johanna Suarez, two big clutch knocks late in this game. And if you look at his numbers recently, Johanna Suarez has been doing a great job in the month of July for the D-backs. Prior to this game, so entering the finale against the Padres, Johanna Suarez in the month of July was 5 for 15 two RBIs, and a 967 OPS. So those numbers across the board are going to go up after this game. Corbin Carroll broke his power drought. I believe it's I believe it was his first home run since May 7th. Like, it's been a long time for Corbin Carroll. He jumped on a pitch high in the zone and smacked it into the right field seats. Need to see more Corbin Carroll do more at the plate, but this was a welcome sign. He was good against the Dodgers, and he was fine in this series against the Padres. Want to see more games where he stacks multiple hits, a lot of games where he goes one for four, one for five. I want to see more games where he's either stacking hits or at least getting on base via the walk. And Moreno, since coming off the injured list, he's been fantastic for the D-backs at the top of the lineup, in the middle of the lineup, wherever you put him. He's been crushing it at the plate since coming off the injured list. So Moreno, Eugenio, and Carroll, all had very good series for the D-backs. We saw the D-backs score in the first inning, in the finale, and in the first game, and then scored in the second inning in the second game. Great job by the D-backs in all three games who put pressure on early against the San Diego Padres. They also did that against the LA Dodgers. Love it when I see the D-backs jump out to early leads. And then how about the answer backs? Are they back? Eight runs from the seventh inning on in the finale, five runs from the seventh inning on in the second game, and then six runs in the ninth inning in the finale. The D-backs for so much of the season was not a good late game offense. So many times we talked about it, seventh inning on, this offense did nothing. But over the last two, three, four weeks, the entire offense has been better. The lineup has been better. And then late game situations, This team has been way more clutch. Friday should have been the game of the year if Paul Seawald was able to close it out. He wasn't, unfortunately, but still a great showing by the D-backs offense late in the game. I mean, in the second game, you had them come through clutch in the 10th inning. The Padres had not lost an extra inning game all season until this series. So great job by the D-backs offense in the second game. Then great job by the D-backs offense in the finale to break the game open. And then a couple clutch pitching performances. Ryan Nelson was fantastic in the finale. You needed a big start with the bullpen having to pitch a lot with Brandon Fott leaving the game early in game number two. You really needed Ryan Nelson to pitch deep into the game, and he did just that. 87 87 pitches, pitch into the seventh inning, one earned run. Great job by Ryan Nelson. He was fantastic. And then also Humberto Castellanos. In game number two, I was nervous when he came in the game. I thought the D-backs were honestly going to lose when I saw him come in that game in the situation that he did, but he was able to close it out. Toy Lovello, not a fan of Paul Seawald right now. He went to Castellanos, and hey, it worked out. D-backs have looked good through two series on this gauntlet before the All-Star break, so let's do a temperature check with the panic meter in segment number two. But hey, before we do a little panic meter check-in, if you think the D-backs are going to win their next series against the Atlanta Braves, then why not place a little wager down on FanDuel Sportsbook because I love sports. I love them so much. I never want them to stop. But as the playoffs wind down, we get fewer games and the sports aren't sporting like I want them to. But FanDuel lets me keep sports going whenever I want. All I have to do is open the app and dream up bets anytime I'm in the mood. And this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long. My favorite thing to do is the same game parlay. When Gallon or Fott are on the mound, take the over on strikeouts 
over on total basis for Keta Marte and give me the D-backs money line. When that hits, it brings a big smile to my face. If you want a big smile on your face, head over to FanDuel.com and start making the most out of your summer. FanDuel, official sports band partner of Major League Baseball. All right, all right, all right. Let's get back into the Locked on Diamondbacks podcast. And let's do a little panic meter. It has been out of five the last couple of weeks. And to be honest, despite the D-backs having a very good month of July, I love how the D-backs are playing right now. I'm going to keep the panic meter at a five. Yes, I know the D-backs are back to 500. I know they just took down two very good NL West opponents in the Dodgers and the San Diego Padres. But... I'm going to give them a five. I know they're starting to look reminiscent of last year's team, right? We're seeing late game clutch offense, which is not something we've typically seen from the D-backs this season. And also, it's a late game offense by guys at the bottom of the lineup. That's what made the D-backs so deadly last year. It was the Domos and the Thomases that came through in the clutch. That's what we saw in the finale. That's what we saw in game number one. Dudes at the bottom of the lineup putting in work, and that's what we've seen recently. We're starting to see more chaos on the bases, right? Speed from the Carrolls and the Jig McCarthys, and now we're sending the Martes, and we're sending the Walkers and the Morenos. Like, we're creating chaos on the bases, getting more aggressive with our steals, getting more aggressive in taking bigger leads and going from first to third and trying to go from first to home at times if you're Carol or Jake McCarthy. Like, I love the fact that we're creating chaos once again. We got a couple relievers in the back that we feel really good about in the Martinez's and the Ginkles and hopefully the Paul Seawalds can come back. We got a couple of frontline starters in the Gallons and I'm calling I'm calling Brandon Fott with how the rotation is set up right now, a frontline starter. So the way that the D-backs are playing right now, very reminiscent of last year's team. And if they can keep up this momentum over the next week, no doubt by next Sunday, I will have the D-backs below a five. I will have them out of four in my panic meter. But the next two series for the D-backs won't be easy as they try to finish off this gauntlet before the all-star break next up the d-backs are going against the atlanta braves who we know have a super stacked roster they are so talented Ronaldo lopez is having himself a breakout season i believe he leads the nl now in era chris sales having a great year max freed is having a great year as well some very dominant pitchers in that Braves rotation, and we will see Chris Sale and Max Freed in this upcoming series. You look at the lineup, a lot of guys have been having down years and struggling outside of a Marcel Azuna, who's going to finish as an MVP finalist most likely. A lot of the guys aren't having the years that they're typically used to, or at least having the years that they had last year. But even that, even with that being the case, Matt Olson, Albies, Austin Riley, like <laughs> Ozuna. Duval, like that's still a lot of guys I'm scared of, even if they're not having a great season. Too many dudes who scare me. Sean Murphy as well, like just too many dudes, such a deep lineup. Uh, It's not easy to take down the Braves, but if you do have to play devil's advocate, the Atlanta Braves are a little vulnerable right now. That's been the theme of July. The Dodgers were vulnerable with their injuries. The Padres were vulnerable with their injuries. The Braves not dealing with as much from the health perspective but seven and eight in their last 15 games not playing their best baseball right now with a four game series coming up if the d-backs can just split it against atlanta i think i would be so happy with that outcome and then after that you got the toronto blue jays where look i know by their record the blue jays are worse than the d-backs the d-backs are a 500 team the blue jays are not i believe After winning today's game, the Blue Jays are now 41 and 49. They are eight games below 500, not looking too pretty as they are in the cellar of the AL East. But I still have a lot of respect for that Blue Jays team overall. I know that they haven't been playing their best baseball this season, but I still think they have a ton of talent. When you look at that rotation, Barrios, Bassett, Gosman is still a very nice one, two, three. You look at the lineup, still got Vlad and Bo Bichette and 
Varsho, who's having, again, a down season, but he can still produce some pops, steal a base. George Springer, like Justin Turner. There's a lot of guys who are having down years, but I still think there's a lot of talent in that Blue Jays organization that scares me. So I wouldn't say it's going to be easy these next two series. That Blue Jays series feels like a trap series for the D-backs. But if the D-backs can at least split the series with the Braves and then win two out of three against the Blue Jays, best believe the panic meter will go down to a four by next Sunday. But the D-backs are a team currently 500, so they can go either direction. They're squaring off two very talented teams, and we know how the D-backs do against talented teams. Very possible the D-backs lose the next two series because they seem to be only good against NL West opponents. Outside of our own division, the D-backs have not played other teams that well outside of like the Cincinnati Reds this season. So for the D-backs, I would love for them to continue this momentum and get above 500. That's been the biggest issue for the D backs. They're always hovering around 500 and typically below 500, but I want the D backs to finish this next week off, right? And then go into the deadline with the mindset of being buyers come the deadline, not sellers come the trade deadline, because I think if the D backs go four and three this week, it will set them up for a post all-star break run which i'm really excited for and i also believe because of that the d-backs if they finish this next week off right they should be buyers come the trade deadline which i want to discuss in segment number three but hey if you need help filing filing taxes with the irs then i suggest tax network usa because here on lockdown diamondbacks we pride ourselves on getting you the latest news for your team whether it's the off season the draft spring training or the playoffs it's year round you know what else is year round collection season just because tax season is over doesn't mean the irs will stop coming after you for unfiled taxes the irs can garnish your wages levy your bank accounts and even seize your property don't let the IRS target you. Let the licensed professionals and tax experts at Tax Network USA go to bat for you. With over 14 years of experience and an A-plus rating by the Better Business Bureau, Tax Network USA has saved their clients over $1 billion in tax debt. Whether you owe taxes, have complicated matters that require tax planning, or finally hit that parlay this season and need help correctly filing, call 1-800-549-1000 or visit tnusa.com slash locked on. Be sure to mention lock on Diamondbacks at checkout and you'll receive a $250 discount off their services. And also, why not bet on America's number one daily fantasy sports app called Prize Picks? Because with over 5 million active members, it is the most exciting and easiest way to play daily fantasy sports. Unlike other apps on Prize Picks, it's just you against the numbers. All you do is pick more or less on two to six player stats projections and watch the winnings roll in. Get in on the daily action with your friends and become part of the Prize Picks community today. With the finals over, the hoops action doesn't stop on prize picks. Women's basketball is still heating up with stars like Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese looking to make names for themselves along greats like Brianna Stewart and Aja Wilson. You could win up to 100 times your cash watching them ball out. So download the prize picks app today. And use code LOCKDOWNMLB for a first deposit match up to $100. That's code LOCKDOWNMLB on prize picks for a deposit match up to $100. Prize picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. All right, all right, all right. Let's get back to the Lockdown Dimebacks podcast. And let's talk about why the D-backs should never be sellers. And if they want to do anything at the deadline, they need to be buyers. Because I've heard talk from the GM and from people just online saying maybe the D-backs should be sellers. Maybe they should trade like a Christian Walker while his value is the highest. And if the D-backs suck until the deadline, why like why shouldn't they move pieces like Jock Peterson or Randall Gritchick or see what they could get for Jake McCarthy, yada, yada, yada. I understand the thought process of if the D-backs suck until the deadline, which is July 30th, July 30th, that they should sell some of their pieces. I understand the philosophy 
behind why the D back should become sellers at the deadline as certain variables break. But regardless, I disagree with the philosophy. I don't think there's any scenario essentially from the D backs losing every single game up until the deadline. I don't think there's a realistic scenario where the D backs should become sellers at the deadline. Even if the D backs suck until the trade deadline, they will probably still be within three and a half games of the wild card because guess what? The rest of the National League just isn't that good this season. I don't think the NL is good enough where the D back should be selling off players with two months ago. You're looking at the standings right now. Like, who really terrifies you in the NL wild card where, like, yeah, if I go in a two week slump, like, I couldn't catch these teams. Are you that scared of the Cardinals, who I know are five games below or who I know are five games above 500? The Cardinals also have one of the worst run differentials in the National League. Minus 39. Do I really trust that old Cardinals team? Probably not. The Padres, I actually do like the Padres, so I won't say anything bad about them. The New York Mets, I know they've been hot in the month of June. Long term, do I think they could keep it up another two months? I don't think so. The San Francisco Giants, I never believe them entering the season. So am I surprised that they're three games below 500? No, I don't really believe in the Giants. The Pirates, I think, are way too young and just not talented enough. The Reds, I do think, are talented enough, but not experienced enough. The Nationals, I don't think are there just yet. I think they're a couple years away. The Marlins don't care about winning, and the Rockies suck. Like, in the National League, I am not scared of the field. I am not scared of any of those teams that the D-backs are in a two-week spoon. You should not be selling off your players at the deadline because of that National League field. There's no one that you can't catch in that NL wildcard field. That's why, if anything, the D-backs need to go out there and add at the MLB trade deadline. If Merrill Kelly and Erod really aren't going to come back until August, then we should think about adding a solid innings eater to hold it down. Maybe someone even better than that, like a Tyler Anderson, who is having himself a pretty good season with the Angels. See someone that you would think about going out there and acquiring to hold it down until Erod and Kelly gets back. Is he too good? Maybe you just want someone like a Johnny Cueto. But at that point, I don't mind just running like the Ryan Nelsons of the world. Maybe go out there and add another back-end reliever. If you really are worried about Paul Seawald consistently being your closer, maybe go out there and get a Mason Miller from the Oakland A's. Do you think about finally upgrading third base? I know Eugenio Suarez has been better in the last week and a half, but still, do I trust Eugenio Suarez long-term over the course of the second half of the season? Probably not. There are definitely moves that the D back can make to improve this team. The D back should be thinking about improving, not selling off pieces, trading away Christian Walker. I know his value is the highest as he's a pending free agent, having himself a fantastic season. I don't think trading him would be a smart move at all. I think he's undervalued in baseball. I think he's and I think he's going to end up signing a contract. This offseason with the D-backs, that's probably less than his perceived value by D-backs fans. I think we all know Christian Walker is a stud and should be viewed as one of the better first basemen in baseball, but I don't think baseball views him that way. I wouldn't be surprised if he signs a contract with the D-backs and you're like, oh, that's way more reasonable than I thought. Christian Walker should be getting like 18 to 20 million. I wouldn't be surprised if he signs for like three for 45 or something like that. I would not be surprised at all. And I also don't think if you traded Christian Walker, I don't think you would net a return. That would be better than Christian Walker at this stage of his career. So I would much rather keep him. I'm holding on to Gritchick and Jock. They have been great offseason signings and they've been so good for the D-backs this season. I am not moving them off just to sell them, to get back a random prospect that probably won't amount to much. I'm not doing it. Now, if the D-backs want to make a splash and say, you know what, Jake McCarthy, Blaze Alexander, and somebody else, let's go get Crochet from the Chicago White Sox. Like, I would be okay with that. If you want to add a young starting pitcher with major upside that could be in the rotation for years to come, like, okay, I would be okay with that kind of move. But don't be selling off guys just to sell them. You're not where you want to be based off expectations right now, but... If this team really gets healthy in the second half and the rotation gets better, we're seeing the lineup get better. We're seeing guys who are struggling get better. Like, I do think this team could get on a run in the second half of the season and finish 
the year where we had them entering the year and finish actually near the expectation level that we had for the D-backs. But to do that, they need to add at the deadline. Don't be sellers. Get healthy in that rotation. Hopefully, Erod and Kelly can come back. Hopefully, guys like Gurriel, Moreno, Carroll, and Suarez only get better as the second half of the season progresses. And if all that could coagulate together in a nice melting pot, I believe the D-backs can go on a run in the second half of the season and really finish toward, you know, really finish where we had them in our expectation levels entering the season. I truly believe that the D-backs still have the potential to make a run in the postseason, but first they have to get there and you're not getting there by selling off pieces at the deadline. So please D-backs, if anything, be buyers and add more talent as the trade deadline approaches. Now that's it for this edition of the Locked on Dimebacks podcast. Come back tomorrow for more Dimebacks news coverage and insight. And as always, stay safe, stay healthy. Deuces.